artist on the record, your ultimate intimate conversation with your favorite artist today in the hot seat, the legendary, the sound, the man, the original, Mr. Dennis Dunaway. It's all happening now. When you met Alice, when you guys connected, did you guys, was it through music? Hey, I like the Beatles. You like the Beatles. Let's be friends. How did you guys meet? Uh, the Beatles hadn't hit yet. Uh, we we did talk about music because Alice, uh, as anybody could tell watching any of his interviews, he's he's always been the guy that knew the latest songs and the latest TV shows and all of that. Uh, and uh, uh, so we met in uh, art class and there was a lot of people in the art class, but nobody that cared about Magritte or Dolly or the surrealist and pop art and all of that. Well, uh, Alice, whose name was Vince, of course, at that time, was on board with that. So him and I would sit together at tables and talk about, you know, uh, art. And 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 we did we had a very Ferris Bueller thing going at that school. We had our whole network of friends. So when we finally decided to start a band, uh, it was over. Uh, we we decided to incorporate art into a rock band. So we wanted it to be like surrealism in a show with just uh, like, and also like a, a New York city happening where all these things would happen and people would have to try to associate what it meant. And it didn't, and it would mean something different to everybody. So that was the concept. Uh, but when we first started growing our hair, this school was very strict. If you look straight up and they could see your hair below your earlobes, you got kicked out of school. Wild. And so when we started growing our hair, we had uh, our network of friends because the hall cops would be out looking around, you know, who were, you know, uh, overly inflated, self-appointed, uh, you know, uh, they would tattle on us, you know, and we would get in trouble. So uh, that's so they would say, hey, the hall cops are in building three, you know, so we'd duck into the dark room or whatever. And that's when we got Glenn Buxton to be in our band, uh, mainly because he could play guitar and we needed a guitar player, but also because he was a he took photography because he knew that if he was in the dark room and the red light was on, nobody could open the door and he could smoke in there. <laughs> so, so he would also there. Uh, I was also the first guy in journalism class. Uh, and so and then I brought Alice in later when I met him and we were in journalism. So we would write stories about our band, the earwigs, but we would also have Glenn touch up photographs so it looked like our hair was short. So that so that the principal would always see, oh, these clean cut guys, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. See the old clean cut. Wow. So what was the influence of you guys? Like uh, music wise, what were you guys listening to as kids? You know, we bond. Uh oh, we listened to, uh, you know, uh, AM radio in Phoenix, Arizona at the time was you know, it was pretty homogenized like the rest of the country, you know, but we would pick out the Beach Boys and, you know, Chuck Berry and various things that we thought were cool. And Elvis was big with us. And uh, but but um, in 1963, I saw Dwayne Eddy perform a surprise performance at a double feature movie. And I said, wow, wow, that's so exciting. You know, they did Rebel Rouser and all of that. And I'm like, uh, I, that's what I want to do. I want to be in a band. So I mentioned it to Vince and, uh, you know, and we were talking about it. That's when we were talking about, oh yeah, we could do artistic ideas. And then the Beatles hit and everything became British invasion for us. I mean, it just sucked us in. It's like, it was like uh, Dorothy's house in the Wizard of Oz yeah. landing. it's black and white film. And then, when it lands in Oz, all of a sudden it's Technicolor. That's what the Beatles were in Phoenix, Arizona and across the country too. But, you know, the top 10 songs on AM radio in Phoenix were Beatles. The top 10. Every wow. song was a Beatles single. Wow. That's how, that's how big it hit. 
And of course, uh, you know, we were also ran cross country. So we were around a lot of jocks that made fun of long hair and all of that and made fun of the Beatles. So the Letterman's Club would host these talent shows. And of course, we couldn't be in it because we were hosting it as Alice and I were both Letterman for long distance cross country and for running the mile and half mile and track. Mm. And anyway, so I convinced them with Alice's help, which, you know, Alice can talk anybody into anything. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and we talked them into letting us do a spoof. So we presented it like we were going to be making fun of these long hair guys, and we would wear wigs, and we would change the words to Beatles songs to be sports-oriented. So they agreed to do that, you know. Uh, we weren't really competing because we were hosting the show, but we were do a surprise performance. And we did. We got Glenn Buxton because we didn't know how to play. I didn't even know what instrument I would play. Neither did Alice. We, oh. we just, pre we just got our dad's guitars and pretended to play, but Glenn Buxton really played. And so we did like, uh, I think four or five songs. We did, uh, uh, foot stomping. Remember that song? Foot yeah, oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was our opening song. And we started when the curtain was closed and this was in our auditorium at our high school. And, uh, so we started stomping our feet. And then the curtain opened, then we stomped our way up to the front of the stage and then went into the lyrics of the song, you know. But it would be like a track shoe stomping all over you, right? And then yeah. please, please me was, please beat me, oh yeah, or I'll beat you, you know, <laughs> track, you know, really dumb. It was like, uh, you know, we were just kids, but man, we it was so exciting. Uh, you know, we were on stage and actually that was in the spring of 1964. So, um, so that's how, that was my very first time on stage, Alice's first time performing, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and everybody, oh, that was fun. That was really funny. That was hilarious, you know, but we're like, you know what, we got to be a real band. And, uh, we became the, the band that everybody love to hate at school because uh, they would be in the cafeteria eating and the curtain would open because the auditorium was also the cafeteria. They'd be eating and the curtain would open. It'd be the earwigs again and everybody, oh no, you know, by, by now we had learned to play instruments, but we even played, uh, you know, they had study hall. So it's a class where you could go to do your homework if you had too much to get done at home or you had something to do that night, you could go to study hall and, and uh, study and the earwigs would show up and play. So I went up to Oregon. Uh, everybody decided what instrument they wanted to play. And we decided that Alice who could never keep track of anything that he owned, uh, couldn't keep track of an instrument. So we saw, and also he could remember lyrics much faster than the rest of us. So he said, okay, he's the singer by default. Without and, even, without even knowing if he could sing or if he was great or not, just because he has a great memory. Give he, him had, a gig. <laughs> he was, he was not somebody that anybody would choose as a singer because his <laughs> voice was so nasally, you know, but but, you know, he was charismatic back then. You know, he he knew he everybody was Alice's friend, you know, yeah. no matter where he went. Everybody is his friend and he can talk to anybody and, and he can make them smile because he knows how to say what people like to hear. And he genuinely, you know, that's his personality. And it was then, you know, I used to say that Alice could make opening a can of tuna fish sound interesting. <laughs> 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 Uh, but we, and also being on the journalism staff, we could promote our, our band, you know, that we would have stories about the earwigs early days in cesspool, England, right. <laughs> and, and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, and all of a sudden, uh, the girls would smile at us when they saw us walking down the hallway instead of, you know, turn around to go the other direction. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, and then we got a job at the local uh, hot club in Phoenix, uh, the VIP, which, uh, you know, the movie American Graffiti, the cars cruising down. Okay. Well, Phoenix had Central Avenue was just like that. All the great hot rods and everything in the 
dry desert, so there was no rust or anything. And uh, they would drive up one, to one end of Central and turn around in the parking lot of an A&W root beer place. And then they'd come down and they'd turn around in the parking lot of the VIP. And it was hopping. There were surfers. There were cowboys. There was uh, hot rod guys. There was, And there was like uh, five guys with long hair, pretty much. <laughs> 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 and a few, few others, actually, the tubes were in that, uh, you know, elite uh, group of uh, musicians that all stuck together because, uh, you know, the more we the more people we had, the less uh, attacks we would get from the cowboys out in the parking lot. So uh, we got into this club doing theatrics and uh, we we would come up with something new every week. And uh, therefore, you know, by then we had learned to play uh, in a short period of time because we practiced all the time. But it was me going over to Glenn Buxton's house and we'd have, uh, you know, whatever. It, it would be a Les Paul record or it would be like uh, mostly the Stones because it was easy to learn mm -hmm. and Chuck Berry and things like that. And Glenn... You know, he sat me down. I, ha I had gone to Oregon, worked on my grandpa's farm, got the money, came back to Phoenix, bought a base, which was an airline, uh, which was a beginner's base from Montgomery Ward. Glenn helped me pick it out. And then I would sit down at his house. And the very first thing he said, before we even start, always remember the most important thing is the feel. You know, the notes or only to help you get the feel, right? And so then he he taught me how to tune and he taught me the names of where the notes fell on the neck. And then we would drop the needle over and over and over on a record and we would learn a bunch of new songs. And then Alice, we'd tell Alice, okay, we we just learned, uh, you know, Down the Road a Peace, the Stones version of a Chuck Berry song. And, and we just learned this and that. And then... Uh, at the VIP, we would do different songs or at least introduce a bunch of new songs every weekend. And the concept there was this guy that ran the club was very uh, uh, Dick Clark like. He always wanted to know what what the fresh new latest flavor of gum was for the teens. Right. And therefore, he would have a new house band, which would open for all the other bands that came in. Uh, and they would last about two or three weeks before he'd have to get the new flavor. Well, we were we knew about that, and we were not going to have it be replaced because we were we were making money, man, living at home still, and our and new equipment and everything. So uh, the the concept that we came up with is we're going to come up with new songs every weekend. We're going to come up with a new theatrical thing that will get everybody to talk about us. And we're going to keep evolving so fast that two weeks from now, we're not going to be recognized as the same band. And that worked for us. We, it got so crazy that we, we had to do something new for every set, which mm -hmm. meant four, four new things every weekend. And, uh, and the radio uh, ads were blasting the spiders, the spiders. <laughs> And we were called the Spiders because the guy that owned the club said, "Earwigs got to go." You know, oh, well, really? <laughs> yeah, and uh, and he came up with the Spiders, and we're like, "Okay, well, that's still a creepy bug, so we'll go with it." <laughs> I mean, where did you come up with all this madness on the bass and this own technique and your sound? I just want to know all well, this. Uh, well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, uh, one reason is that I I just was so hell bent on being different than other bands. You know, uh, Glenn used to call me the pest, you know, and Glenn was one of those guys that he, it was kind of like if you met Don Rickles and he didn't insult you, you know, Glenn, you liked getting insulted by Glenn. Yeah. <laughs> he called me the pest because I was always the guy that was, you know, uh, determined to cruise. I was crusading for, not sounding like other bands or not looking like other bands. And so that was a lot of it. Uh, the other thing is overcompensation. I don't think I've ever talked about this before, uh, but overcompensation, because 
I learned to play on the airline, which had a very short neck for like a, a kid. So I, I, I learned to play with three fingers. I, I rarely used my pinky. And so, because I always felt, oh my God, people are in the audience thinking, oh, this guy's got to be, you know, an idiot to not use all of his fingers, uh, that I, I worked extra hard to try to come up with things that would keep them from being able to say that I was uh, less of a bassist. So that was part of it too. But also it was, it had to do with, uh, we were all writing songs in the same room from the ground up. And when it came to the point where we were writing our own uh, songs, uh, and I had learned uh, a lot from uh, McCartney and, and of course, Aunt, Aunt Whistle and, uh, you know, learning all of those songs when we were a cover band. But when we started covering Yardbird songs, that's when, that's when the light went on over my head that bass didn't have to just play root notes, you know, because Paul Samuel Smith, everybody talks about the three guitar players in the Yardbirds. They don't even talk about Chris Dreya, who was a great guitar player too, but uh, Clapton, Beck, and uh, uh, Page, of, of course, they overshadowed the bass playing, which was very progressive. They were taking blues songs and turning them into progressive, early versions of progressive rock. So when I heard uh, that and we learned some Yardbird songs and that I'm like, okay, I can write anything I want. I don't have to just uh, hold down the bottom. Now that's giving up something, you know, hold, holding down the bottom is, a major, uh, that's the job of a bassist in most bands. You know, if you're doing metal, you need that big, low bottom to the music. Well, I gave that up uh, in order to play. You, you know, people say, like you said, lead bass. You know, people say I you played lead bass. I didn't look at it that way. I looked at it like, hey, there's all these notes on the neck. I'm going to use them, you know, and so if we're writing a song and the melody, you know, Alice is singing something that I think needs support, I might write a counter melody to that. Or, and in the same song, I might land on the bass drum and lock in with the bass drum for a section. Or if the guitar players are doing something, I might pick up on that. So I would always use that kind of, uh, organic freedom to take the bass, let it go wherever it wanted to go. And it would always start with me doing the most bizarre, crazy, abstract things I could possibly think of, and then whittling it down to what supported the song. You know, and I think Neil did that too. You know, uh, you can't talk about just what a bass does without what a, the drummer was doing. You know, and Neil and I worked very well together. He would be totally trying all these crazy drum parts and I'd be trying all these crazy bass parts. And then all of a sudden, Hey, wait a minute. I like what you're doing. You know, let me, let me lock into that. And, and it was very disruptive sometimes to the, to the session, to the writing session that we would be having. Uh, but uh, most, most uh, the other band members knew it was futile to try to talk us into taming things down because Neil and I were like, uh, you know, very adamant about us, like a steamroller. You didn't want to stand in front of it and try to stop it or something. But when, when things started to lock in, it would sound like a locomotive coming through the room. Hey kids, there's going to be more of Dennis Dunaway coming up right here. All you got to do is click on this box right over here and hit the bell to be reminded and subscribe to our channel when we do release these episodes. You're not going to want to miss the episodes that we're releasing, so make sure you subscribe and hit that bell to be reminded. Now get out of here, you crazy kids.